Hey, good morning, SEC. Here's our call to worship from Psalm 99. It says this, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statutes he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but you were an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Good morning, welcome to Shoe Shop Community Church. As all the campuses are together today, um, thanks for joining us in Chase. Good morning, SCC, uh, and it's uh, interview time as we've been doing on the central services. And my name is Steve McLean, uh, Sorrento campus pastor. And this morning, uh, I get to have a little chat with Richard McGill, uh, our our lead counselor, pastor at uh, the Redemption Counseling Ministries in Salmon Arm, SCC, Shushwap, and virtually around the world. Correct. 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 Although uh, I will say this, I've only got one international client, so I guess I don't. I'm not sure you can count that as inter, as. Uh, <laughs> you absolutely in my books that makes you uh, an international redemption counselor. 
uh, which is what everybody longs for is to take their ministry internationally. Yes. Not everybody, but you know, there it is. <laughs> um, this morning, we want to take a moment and we want to sort of talk about uh, um, just how the gospel has been um, in, through the pandemic and this kind of just sort of chaotic way of life where we're all separate and different and uh, the, the, the desires and the, the, the things, the temptations of the world have been creeping in. And we want to talk about how you've been seeing people's hearts and minds being transformed, uh, A, by the gospel as you've been uh, working with different folks in counseling settings, but also just what is this, this new way of life doing uh, to people in, in the way that, uh, uh, you know, our hearts and our minds are being conflicted because of what's going on in the world. Uh, so Richard, what do, you, what do you see happening in today's world? Yeah, um, that's a really good way of putting it. I, 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 the interesting thing about this lockdown is that, uh, and the stresses involved and the fears involved in, in the, the pandemic, uh, it's not that it's bringing out new problems. Uh, the fact is, is, is we've always had these problems. If, if you're dealing with fear right now, you've dealt with fear before. If you're dealing with depression right now, you've dealt with depression before. If, you're, if, if your family is in trouble right now, uh, the problems that are causing it to be in trouble right now were there before. And, and this pandemic, the stress, and all that's doing is, is stripping away all the coping mechanisms that you used, all the, mm. all the escape routes that you had before. It's stripping all that away, and it's exposing those problems. Um, right. and, and so that's actually a really good thing because when those problems are exposed, the gospel can, uh, can be applied. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, I absolutely love being able to, being a counselor in this time because people are coming uh, that actually thought they kind of had it together, uh, right. that were actually able to, uh, to sort of on their own terms deal with whatever, the, the fear, the anxiety, uh, the addictions. Um, I'm seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing a lot of the addictions come up right now. Um, the, the depression, the... Um, the marriage issues, the family uh, dynamics, um, uh, all the problems that I'm dealing with right now, uh, they're problems that, should, that probably should have been dealt with a long time ago. And it's beautiful because actually this is the thing that God used, this, this pandemic, this, yeah. this lockdown is, is the thing that God used to force them out uh, and actually seek the help that they've needed for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting how... Uh, the pandemic has transformed the way we do life, right? Yeah. You know, now all of a sudden people are living at home. Uh, people don't have the same rhythms and routines and how that has uh, not subtly, it's, it's been for some people, it's a sharp contrast to suddenly um, uh, the way that, the way that the idols in their lives express themselves has completely changed. Right. So that person right. that was, uh, a workaholic who found their value in in working hard and and being that person who put in longer hours and made more money and all those kinds of things. Well, now longer hours is really hard to figure out how that works, right? Like it's right. it's not the way. So suddenly, that thing that you were holding on to so hard has been ripped away, mm -hmm. and that that's you know to take that old track ver uh, you know logic and say the throne of our heart is now empty because that that thing was ripped away by the pandemic it's it's incredible how many um other things people have grasped onto uh you know you yeah. mentioned addictions um people who you never would have thought had issues with you know drugs or alcohol or or any numbers of ways that addictions um present themselves suddenly people are saying you know well i can't work hard so i might as well try these things Right. Or, you know, they were there before, but suddenly they become so yeah. much bigger. Uh, yeah. And that's uh, pastorally, right? We're always looking at people going through that curve where, where you're, you're, you're going through this real, sin reality towards the cross and then uh, restoration, repentance, uh, back towards worship of, of God. Yeah. Um, so, you know, pastorally, this is how we apply, right? We, we apply the gospel into people's lives and say, look, this is, this is the beautiful arc that we are traveling on um, in the counseling setting. Um, how is that? How is that 
is that the same process that you're looking at when you work with people? How is that working for, for you as a counselor with folks? Yeah, it, you know, one of the great things, one of the amazing things uh, about my job, uh, about my, my work as a counselor is the fact that it hasn't, I've been able to continue with it. Um, it, it wasn't disrupted like a lot of the other uh, ministries in the church. And, and it, it, it's so exciting. It's funny. I, the only real difference I did was is I did offer, if, uh, as a choice, as an option, online counseling. I haven't had a single person take me up on that unless they were actually, they just physically lived too far away. Mm. To, to, if they could come in at all, they came in. And, and I think that, um, that uh, just that longing for, for personal connection, that face-to-face connection, uh, was a great help at the counseling mm-hmm. center. And uh, we're, still in, we're still open for, uh, for regular business. Um, myself and my contract counselors are all, uh, all have availability. Um, we, uh, and we long to be able to work through and work with you as you're trying to deal with these problems that have always been there, uh, but are now being exposed um, in yeah. ways that probably that might have surprised you, uh, yeah. um, whoever you are, you is. <laughs> um, um, and so uh, we would love the opportunity. Please call our office um, uh, and and set up an appointment if you feel like you need to, or you can do it online at redemptioncounseling.org. Uh, slash shoe swap. Uh, that's redemption counseling, American smell it, spelling, which means only one L. I don't know why that ha- why that is, but uh, that's true. Um, and or you can look us up on Facebook. Um, uh, we've got a lot of social media presence as well. So yeah. Instagram is there, Twitter's there. Uh, you can you can find us pretty much anywhere you want to find us. Yeah, and, and people people can connect with you too through a, a, a place to belong.ca, right? Like correct, you, correct. there's links through through there. So so if you're uh, in the shoe shop community church, the the place to belong.ca uh, is a, is a fantastic tool for connecting to uh, pastors and and also the counseling center as well. So um, yeah, it's it's been it's been interesting to watch. I mean, obviously, I'm not uh, I'm not one of the counselors. I'm not in the the counseling um, yet. Yet I'm. <laughs> The ministry, uh, but it's been interesting to watch just how uh, how that ministry is growing. And uh, like as you say, you've still got space. There's still capacity uh, mm-hmm. for you to to add people in as as, as clients. Um, how does it work? Just in case people don't know, how does it work for things like payments and all of that kind of stuff? Like, is there is there help for people? Is there sure sure. Um, that's a great question, and, and the answer is absolutely. Uh, never let finances be a problem. Our, our standard rates are $80 for individual, $100 for couples, but, uh, but, no, but no. I mean, if that's, if that's an issue, then we understand that, especially in this time period when a lot of you are out of work uh, or are grossly underemployed. And so if you need us, if you need help, uh, and you can't, aff- you know, can't afford those rates, then don't worry about it. Please, please contact us anyway. We will help you yeah. uh, um, pay what you can and, yeah. and we'll take care of it anyway. Yeah, it's, and that's the thing that sometimes I think people are missing is that this is actually the counseling center is a, is a, is a ministry. Yeah. not not a for profit organization right so exactly. there's 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 room to have conversations with people about where they're at in, in all stages uh, of life and and the best thing about the counseling center that i love this is this is me and my personality hmm. i love that to set up an org, uh, set up an appointment to talk to somebody about the issues that are going on in my life i don't actually have to talk to somebody i can do that all online <laughs> which seems counterproductive. Like it's counterintuitive. If I'm, if I'm making an appointment to talk to somebody, the fact that you can do it online without talking to anybody shouldn't be the draw. Cause I'm going to have to talk to somebody, but I love that. Yeah. Uh, Richard, it's been, I also uh, am willing to go out to the other campuses. So yeah. you don't have to come into salmon arm. Uh, we have contract counsel counselors in, in at least some of the other counselor uh, campuses as well. So if you want to do it in person, uh, but you don't want to come into Salmon Arm, uh, we definitely have that option as well. 
Absolutely. Uh, just on Canada Day, I was out to, to uh, Sick and Moose and saw them getting ready. So I saw the the little room that is set up there. And I know that Chase has one in their their new hub. And, and I know uh, for us, that's a it's a priority in Sorrento uh, to to find a space and get that established uh, so that we have that uh, that opportunity in our campus as well. So uh, it's been, ex you know, it's been my pleasure to, uh, you know, I followed you into uh, Shushwap Community Church. It was a week or two after you that I got here and uh, uh, it's been a joy to get to know you. So uh, thanks for coming on and, and joining us and, and, you know, letting me interview you. But uh, can I pray for you and the council sure, ministry absolutely. as we, uh, as we uh, close this down and, and return to uh, to the church service here. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for Richard and Melissa who heard your call and, and uh, crossed borders. They, they literally left uh, an entire uh, an entire way of, and, and of understanding and how to live and how things are done uh, down in the States. They left that behind to come and learn to uh, what it means to be Canadian and what it means to live and function and do ministry in a Canadian context. And uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for their obedience to your call to, on their on their lives. We thank you for the foresight that uh, SCC as a church has had to uh, start a counseling uh, ministry and to search for someone to come and to uh, to put their hand to the plow and to lead and guide that ministry. So we thank you for Richard. We thank you for Melissa's wife who came as well. And we just uh, we want to take a moment and just pray for Richard and in his ministry. We pray that you would continue to give him uh, gospel insight, that you would mm -hmm. help him to understand how to apply the truth that is found in Scripture into the mess that we create in our lives. Uh, that he would be able to do that with love and grace and that people would be able to, as he ministers and speaks and shares, uh, that they would be able to see the love of Christ. They'd be able to see the gentle, caring, loving hand of Jesus guiding and steering them towards the truth that is found in Scripture, the truth that is the gospel that will penetrate uh, deep into hearts and minds and begin to uh, reorientate our thoughts and desires towards Christ uh, in a way that glorifies and honors God the Father. Mm -hmm. So, Father, we ask now that you would pour out a blessing on Richard. We pour out a blessing on to uh, the counseling ministry and that uh, you would use uh, both Richard and the ministry to reach into this community to restore lives. Mm -hmm. Father, we, we long to see uh, the mess of sin undone because of the love and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we long to see people transform from uh, people walking far from God to people who come close to worship and celebrate in what God has done. Uh, for them and in them through Jesus Christ. Mm. So again, we pray for Richard. We pray for the Counseling Center. We ask that you would do a mighty work through the through the, the ministry that has been established here in Shushwap Community Church. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining me, Richard. And uh, I look forward to watching your ministry grow and grow and grow here in the Shushwap as we both grow old together working here at this church. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Hey, church, it's Pastor Bob out in Sycamus at the Hub, and I have today's scripture reading for our sermon. It is from Luke chapter 15, verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told the people this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. There he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept across the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man took him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet and kill the fattened calf. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money with prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, your precious holy word is so wonderful. We thank you for its power. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that it never, ever gets old. That, Father, it is the truth that we need that, Lord, the wonder of this, this story that Jesus told, that, Lord, this story would never get old in our hearts, that, Lord, we would remember our place in it, that, Lord, you would bless Pastor Ben as he brings this word to us, that, Lord, it would activate faith in our hearts, that, Lord, it would give us a heart like yours, that the lost would be found the way that we were found. We pray, Jesus, that as a church in this region, that Lord, you would give us your wisdom. You give us your insight, you give us your passion. You would give us your creativity. You would give us your endurance. That Holy Spirit, you would give us faith to hear this word. That Lord, you would give us action coming out of this sermon. That Lord, we would know what to do with the calling that you will place on our hearts through the word that Ben will give. We pray, Father, that you would help us to focus on what is being said. We pray, Father, you would speak in individual ways to each one of us, that, Lord, when we hear it, Lord, you will give that specific calling to each of us, Lord. We praise you now that your word is truth, that it never comes back void and empty. But, Lord, as it goes out now, that Jesus, you will use it in a big way. I thank you, Lord, for our church. We thank you, Lord, that you, you love us, that you're with us in our living rooms, gathering and in life groups, watching this, this service. We pray, Father, now for Ben, that, Lord, you will ask, that you will give him what he asks for, change lives. And we thank you, God, that you hear our prayer. We love you. We pray this to the glory of you, Father, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, now in his precious name of Christ our Lord, amen. Good morning, church. Glad you could join us on another digital version of our worship gathering today. Thankful for the participation from all of the campuses, and I hope you've been blessed so far. At the end of the service, during the benediction, uh, I will be updating you on some of the decisions and the thinking that we're having around planning for the summer and for the fall, so uh, look forward to that. Until then, let's get into Luke chapter 15, and I hope you still have your Bible open to that passage that Bob uh, has just uh, read for us. This is a very, very familiar story to those of you who have maybe grown up in the church, but it's also familiar to many who haven't grown up in the church. Alongside the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, is one of the most famous stories in the history of the world. It's a story that, that many people are aware of and can relate to. And it's famous because it's brilliant. 
It's brilliant in its understanding of human nature. It's brilliant in its understanding of society. And Jesus here is making extraordinary statements about people and the culture that they live within. It's known as the prodigal son, but I think it would be better to refer to it as a story of two sons or maybe the lost boys. That the obvious redemptive element affects the one son, the, the younger, which is why he kind of comes out as the, the benefactor, maybe even the hero of the story. Whereas the antagonist of the story is the elder brother. Yet what Jesus is trying to do is show us what God's role is towards different types of people. Like many siblings, these two were different. They had a distinct personality. And we see that, that distinction even at work within individuals to this day. That there are still two distinct temperaments. That there's those people who are rule breakers, if you will. They're the rebels. They're focused on their own freedom. And then, on the other side, you've got the rule makers. That's those people who are about respect and about order. In a way, you could say this is left and this is right. This is liberal and this is conservative. The left represented by the younger son, means change in our culture, whereas the right means status quo, where left means liberal and progress, right means conservative and traditionalist. That in a way, you could look and you could say that the divide that we see politically and the divide we see ethically and the divide that we see economically in the world today is represented in these two sons. So you could maybe even make this first initial conclusion that Neither type of person is the integrated, put together that society strives for. You could so go, far, go so far as to say that we need to be saved from the left and from the right. So these siblings were different, but they were also the same. They had two temperaments, but they shared the same heart. Hard hearts towards a gracious and loving father is what they had in common. Tim Keller puts it like this, that both of them, the hearts of the two brothers, were the same. Both resented their father's authority and sought out ways from getting out from under it. They each wanted to get into a position in which they could tell the father what to do. Each one, in other words, rebelled. One did so by being very bad and the other by being extremely good. Both were alienated from the father's hearts. Both were lost sons. Isn't that interesting? He calls them both rebels. They just went about their rebellion differently. The younger expresses his rebellion in in this pursuit of carnal desires and a dream of independence, where the elder expressed his rebellion in an affectionless duty in which he would one day use to fulfill his destiny. And what do we end up seeing? Both of them falling short. The younger, he went for freedom and he ended up being enslaved. The elder, he goes for respect and ends up becoming furious. And I'm sure you can identify with one or the other, or maybe even elements of both. Now, the story is important for us, especially living in society today, because it truly informs how we shape our own Christian worldview. It helps us define and determine how we see society and ourselves within that society. See, if you were to look at society today and use this story to guide you, you could say that the political and cultural climate that we're living in, the tension between right and left, conservative and liberal, change and tradition, is this story without the Father. Christians should have values that sometimes look conservative and sometimes look liberal. But there's enormous pressure to emphasize only one side. And what it creates is a political polarization within the church. So as we look at society and we, we see that this story is the outplay of society with the father removed. If you look at individuals today and you use this story as a guide, you could say that the tension between chasing desires and fulfilling our duties, between rejection of conformity or demands for civility is the story without the father. So as much as this is a story about two different types of people with similarly, similarly hard hearts, This really is a story about God. That he's revealing to us his true character and it's him that brings about reconciliation between temperaments 
And it's through him that we see hearts changed. Today, I'd like us to emphasize and look at the grace of the Father. The grace of the Father here is, works itself out in movement, power, and scandal. When we try to understand ancient cultures, when we look at the Bible for an understanding of what life was like back in those days, we're often confronted with, with some ugly things in their societies. The Bible tells a great deal about polygamy within the cultures of those days, slavery. One of the other evils in ancient cultures was primogeniture. This was the belief that the eldest son in a family got everything. That all of the wealth, all of the power, all of the honor always automatically went to the eldest child upon the father's death. That there was no equality in that. What's interesting in scripture though is that God always favors the younger. In that culture, as we read it, the younger brother here really deserved nothing. That he had a claim at all to any part of the inheritance is astonishing. So then what he does next is unthinkable to the first century hearer. For him to say, I would like my portion of the inheritance that he didn't deserve or have any entitlement to at all is scandalous in and of itself. But Jesus speaks about it so that we would see the heartbreak of the father. When we read in verse 11, the son, the younger son coming to his father and saying, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. What a first century hearer would would hear is, I wish you were dead. Like, that's the attitude, that's the spirit, that's the posture that the younger brother is coming to the father with. He's basically saying, I wish you were dead, but since you're taking your time dying, I'm tired of living here, and so I want out. Just give me my cash, and I'm going to go. And that's where we see the movement of grace begin from the Father. We see five movements of grace flowing from a heart of love. The first movement is that of release. In verse 12, he divides the property between them. That doesn't necessarily mean it was a 50-50 split. It does mean, though, that he was willing to give the younger his share. In this demand, the younger really shows that he's a fool, that he's unwilling to work hard and, and grow the whole, including his own share. That had he have stayed, that had he have served, that had he have poured his energy and his effort into the growth of the wealth of the father, he would have had more when his father passed. The father, though, absorbs the dishonor and the hatred And does as this boy desires, he resists an outburst of anger and instead he takes the pain without animosity and fulfills his son's wishes. When I think about even the Garden of Eden and knowing that God was somewhat, somehow present as Adam and Eve rejected everything that he had given them to claim that one thing that they wanted more than anything else, I see even the grace of God in that to not intervene, but instead to release. The movement of grace, though, doesn't stop with releasing. It moves towards expecting. In the previous two stories in Luke 15, we see that God is one who seeks lost things and finds lost things and then celebrates lost things when they're found. In this story, there is a seeking, but it's patient and it's gracious. The father is waiting by the road every day, watching and hoping that his son would appear on the horizon. That his son would come to himself, come to his senses. This is a supernatural expectation that that the son will remember the goodness and love of the father. In that way, this father was helpless, but not hopeless. He really is longing for and praying for A work in the heart of his son to remember. To remember what? The love that he, his dad, had for him. What happens when he sees him, that smudge on the horizon? He runs out to meet him. The father meets him more than halfway. Here we have the son sulking home. He's rehearsing his apology in his mind and likely fearing his father's retribution. 
But as he's doing that, his dad sees him and runs to him. He's so overcome with the return of his son that he has a physical act, a physical reaction and runs to him, which is incredibly undignified for an old man in that day. When he sees him and he gets to him, he throws his arms around him, kisses him again and again. That's what the text here demands. And that, that would have been unthinkable for the first century here, that that would be the response. Old men don't run. You don't run really unless someone's chasing you. Some people think I'm a runner. They see me around town running. I have to be clear. I'm a plotter, not a runner. Old men don't run, but this is what God does. When that work happens in the heart, that thinking that, that maybe I can return home, that maybe I can return to my father and take on the attitude of a servant, what God does is he comes more than halfway, embraces the lost child, brings him to himself, kisses him over and over again, and then what? Restores him. Verse 22 to 24 gives this description that, that the father calls for this son to be given clean clothes and a ring on his hand. And the description here that in the ways that he wants to honor his son and celebrate his return shows the instant, dramatic, and unexpected change of circumstances and status for the son. For those of us who would call ourselves Christians, we embrace this, that when we come back to the Father, there is this restoration that God rejects our, our desire to be just servants and would rather say to us, no, your sons and your daughters. And in a moment, our circumstances change, our status changes. It is instant, it is dramatic, and it is unexpected. And it doesn't stop there. The final and fifth, fifth and final movement of grace is this celebration. In verse 32, where the father says to the elder son that he says, we had to celebrate. It literally means that there's this necessity to rejoice at the lost son coming home. That it's a divine necessity. That it was the only proper response to the lost son returning. What this would do is it would tell everybody in the community, everybody in that household, how that son was to be treated. That the father's response to the return of the son would dictate how other members of the family, whether they be uh, brothers and sisters, whether they be cousins, whether they be servants, and the broader community, the community at large, how this boy was to be treated was determined by how the father treated him and that he celebrated him, told everybody, this is my son whom I love and I'm glad he's home. We see this movement of grace and it's a movement of grace that brings about an incredible power in the life of this person. And in that way, we kind of grab on to that. The Bible talks a great deal about grace so that we would get some understanding of what it's meant to do in the life of of us as believers and in the life of, lives of us who would identify with the lost son. That we've come to our senses, that we've sought out God as good and loving and, and are desiring to be in a relationship with him. Grace is, number one, necessary for our rebellion and the basis of our mercy. It was necessary for the rebellion of both the brothers, but the one who received it was the one who knew he needed mercy. Paul writes this about himself in 1 Timothy. He says, Formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent of God. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. He received mercy because God had poured out grace. And it came with the faith and the love that he had in Christ. Grace is foundational to receive the love of God and it's what we use to realize his love in our lives. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians that Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. What does grace produce? What's the emotional response? It's love. It's a feeling of love that 
that feels like eternal comfort and good hope. We see that it's evident, grace is, in the incarnation of Jesus, that it's Jesus who is the one who comes really more than halfway. He comes all the way to the earth, comes all the way into the pit that we're in, like that younger son was, and tries to cause us to remember the love of a good father. John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know the story. Moses had to climb the mountain to get into the presence of God where he received the law and he brought it back down to the people of Israel. Jesus is so, such a better Moses because he comes down and gives us himself. He's the one who came more than halfway. We know God runs to us because Jesus came close to us. Grace is powerful in the supernatural way that the, the truth of forgiveness restores relationships. In Romans 5, we see where sin increase, grace abounds all the more. That there is always forgiveness for those, for those who hate their sin. For those who recognize that repentance is the means to restoration. And it is the means to rejoicing and celebrating the grace and the goodness of God. And finally, that it is, grace is, central to the celebration, which is the obvious expression of God's love, which is why Ephesians tells us that we praise him because of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Christ. It's really important that we see that the Father in this story is our Heavenly Father is God himself. When we turn to him, he's a God who comes running to lavish his love upon us. And this is the gospel. The good news of a God who rushes to meet sinners with his love. And no one, no one is beyond this love. However, we must see ourselves in the lost son and we must recognize that we are wayward if we want to experience his love. Because if we can't see ourselves in the lost son, then we may be the elder brother who was scandalized by grace. An older brother comes in from the fields. He's been working, doing his duty. And he grumbles. That same word used in verse 2, where the Pharisees are grumbling at the grace that Jesus is showing to tax collectors and sinners by eating with them. The elder the elder brother sees grace as somewhat scandalous. To the younger brother, it was totally surprising. I mean, the younger brother, he had a whole speech plan. He had lowered his expectations. He was humbled and he expected on the basis of his, of his humility to really be humiliated. He's surprised by the grace. He's surprised by the restoration. He's surprised by the celebration. The older brother's response is not to rejoice that his younger brother has come home. Instead, it's to be scandalized. He's demonstrating a graceless heart. See, in his mind, there appears to be forgiveness without atonement. And that's the scandal of the story. It looks and appears as though there's an injustice at work here towards the father, according to the elder brother, and maybe even towards himself. Atonement is this big word. It's this word that really means that there's a payment necessary for the evil actions that one commits. It's the punitive side of justice. And you, if you don't have punishment, you can't have justice. Then there's forgiveness. This is this is the other side of the coin that is justice, where there's some sort of compassion given to the perpetrator of evil actions. And, and whereas atonement is the punitive side of justice, forgiveness is the restorative side of justice. That the purpose of atonement is to bring about restoration. So from the elder brother's perspective, there's been an injustice inflicted upon the father and upon himself. And the elder brother is requiring some sort of atonement. He may not be able to handle the grace that his father is showing to his brother. He resents his father for that, right? He says, you haven't even given me anything and you're going to throw him a party? He was the one who betrayed you. He was the one who rejected you. He was the one who used you and manipulated you. That there has to be some sort of work of atonement before he can be restored, before he can even become a slave in this household. Isn't that funny? It's very, very relatable. 
See, our society often demands atonement for injustice, but is repulsed by forgiveness. But there was a cost to this. There was atonement. It just wasn't the younger son who paid the penalty. It was the father who paid the penalty. Yeah, he was the one who was hurt. That he felt the betrayal. That he felt the heartbreak. That he felt the resentment. But the penalty that he would pay would be the shame that he would have in restoring the younger son. See, this father would have been thought of to be a fool in the community. That the forgiveness that he gave to his son would be, would be mocked and he would be scorned. It would have cost him his place in the community. It would have cost him his standing. He would live his life shamed for the grace that he showed this boy, for the forgiveness that is displayed. There was a cost. It just didn't go on the younger. It went on the father himself. This is really important for us because when we consider the gospel, which is centered on the atoning work of Christ on the cross, we see what our forgiveness cost God. We see our helplessness being met by his sacrifice. We see the true son rejected by God the father in order that we might be loved. Just like the killed fattened calf whose blood was spilled so that there could be a celebration, so that there could be a restoration, a resurrection, so that there could be grace. In that same way, Christ's blood was spilled. The cost for forgiveness was put on him so that there could be a restoration, a resurrection, and a celebration for each of us. See, Christ's blood was the cost of our forgiveness. Some people just don't see it. Some people just don't think it's enough. They don't think Jesus suffered enough for there to be forgiveness of others. That there should be some sort of additional atonement before there can be restoration. Sometimes it's how we view ourselves, right? We minimize the suffering of the cross. We diminish the grace of God and say, I know God's forgiven me, but I'm going to keep punishing myself. In other ways, we look on the evils that are done in society and we demand that there be justice. We demand that there be forgiveness before we can even entertain the thought, before we can even entertain the thought of restoration and reconciliation. And what we see, though, here in the elder brother is that when we, refuse the, when we refuse God's grace to others, we're actually refusing it for ourselves. You see, the same grace that the elder brother needed was the grace that he resisted for his brother. See, the grace that the father shows to the elder brother is obvious here. He pursues him. He realizes that the family is incomplete. The father's in partying. They're having this great celebration. And it dawns on him, someone's missing. And he goes out and he seeks out the elder brother. He calls him my son, literally saying, my child. But that wasn't the way the elder brother viewed himself. The elder brother viewed himself <laughs> not as a son, but but as a servant. He describes his relationship with the father as almost slavery. He didn't understand the love that the father, his father, had for him. The grace pursued him, though, the grace of the father, and it admonished him. And he says, you're with, always with me, and everything I have is yours. And when he says that, it's an offering, it's an invitation to receive and to celebrate the same grace bestowed on the younger could be bestowed on him as well. God requires his people to rejoice that salvation is coming to the outcast. Uh, he says, this brother of yours, in those words, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees that the outcasts who are receiving life, who are receiving love, were also Abraham's children. They, he, they also were the Pharisees' brothers and sisters. God requires his people to rejoice that salvation is coming to the outcast as a demonstration of the ongoing movement and power of grace in our own lives. How do we have that happen? How do we see that happen? Three ways, and I'll finish with this. By relating to the Father. By representing the Father and by revering the Father. First of all, by relating to the Father. Let me ask you this. Which brother are you? Are you the rule breaker or the rule maker? Are you 
consumed with your own freedom or are you consumed with respect? Let me ask you this. If you don't know, how is grace moving towards you? How would grace confront your shame or your entitlements? Does grace want to restore you or does grace want to soften you? The same grace is there for each of you. The same relationship with the Father. When you receive this grace, everything changes. And you can't not represent this grace to the world. See, that's the second bit. Is that we live out this grace by representing the Father. As we together as Christians, as a church, try to live within our culture, try to reach our society, it's with the same pursuit and posture that the Father has towards both of his lost sons. Consider your lost friends. Remember when we talked about who's your one? Who's the person in your life that God has placed in your life to show grace and love to, his grace and love to? It might mean releasing. That we're not going to hold our society to a standard they can't meet, but know that what we see in the world and in individuals within the world is the result of sin and shame. That we would expect that God can change their lives. That there is no one so far away from the grace of God that they cannot be rescued by it. And it's not that they would be better people, but rather that they would come to their senses and see that God loves them. That we would be the ones who run to them. That we would be the ones who go to them. That we would meet them more than halfway. That we would demonstrate grace at any and every opportunity. It means that we know our lost friends, our lost neighbors, our lost family members. And that we understand how they hurt. And that we try to engage the shame that they might be feeling. That we seek to restore. That it is not to let those who have turned to Jesus find themselves enslaved to servitude but rather that they would know that the essence of Christianity is that their status and circumstances has changed, that their sons, not slaves, Galatians tells us, and then that we would celebrate, that we would revel in the wonder that is the grace of God towards us and towards others, that we would enjoy the blessings of union with Christ and recognize with awe what God's doing in the world because of what he's done in us. Now, this is the example of Christ. This is the example of his ministry and ultimately his sacrifice. He represented the Father to us. He was God in the flesh to us. Finally then, we revere the Father. We revere Jesus. This is what Jesus is teaching, that, that God with a grace so scandalous is worthy not of our rejection or our disrespect, but he's worthy of our worship, our adoration, our love. This is what it means to be a Christian, is to center our lives, our values, our behaviors on him and live out reverence to him, to see ourselves, to see the world as he sees it with love and with grace. In the spiritual vacuum that we live in, which is a rejection of society towards God, politics is elevated to religious practice, practice, and entertainment, sports, and business becomes politicized. Society is demanding that everybody hold ideals that they cannot conform to. Society is demanding that we divide ourselves on the basis of those ideals, whether it be individuality or whether it be the common good, whether it be social justice or whether it be conservative economics. But when God is inserted into society, like the Father is inserted into this, into this story, we see that there is reconciliation through a relationship with the Son and empowerment by the Spirit. And it's there that we're united, given a purpose, and able to celebrate what it means to be loved. That's the power of this story. Do you know God as this type of Father? Let's pray together. Lord, as we bow before you today, Jesus, we thank you that you are the perfect elder brother 
that you are the better elder brother in this story, that you are the one who brings us into a relationship with the Father, that we might not be slaves, but we might be sons, and that we might be daughters, that we might be known as children, that we might hear the Father say to us, everything I have is yours. Come and celebrate. Lord, use that grace to soften our hearts, to break off the parts of our heart that are hard as demonstrated to people within the world that we live in, the lost people, the rebels, the dirty, the marginalized, the ones who have manipulated and abused and have broken your hearts. Oh God, that you would do a work in our church, in Shushwap Community Church, as she lives and breathes in Chase Sorrento, Salmon Arm, Sycamus, and Enderby, that would represent you well to the watching world. That, Lord Jesus, we would be like you, the true elder brother, and not like the elder brother in this story. Lord, I pray for those who identify with the younger brother right now, and I would ask that they would come to their senses and remember that you love them and that they have a home. That if they humble themselves and cry out to you, that you will meet them more than halfway that you will change their status and their circumstances in a direct and immediate way. In your name and for your glory, I pray. Amen.
thank you again for joining us another Digital Sunday uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this is going to be your last of our central services for a while. We're making plans, though, for the summer and for the fall uh, in order to uh, reconnect uh, with one another. This summer, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you within neighborhoods, uh, parks, um, where we can regather as a church on a smaller scale. Uh, the pastors and the elders are looking forward to this and we're hoping to host any number of different opportunities to, to gather the church. Coming into the fall, um, we're really trying hard to make sure that we have a plan that is focused on safety and the participation of everyone. I know that a lot of businesses are using the word reopen. I don't know if that's the proper word to use for church though. I think a better word would be launching. Launching is a word that we use around church planting when we start something new. Reopening gives us the sense that everything will be back to normal, but I don't think it's going to be back to normal for a while. At the same time, we value the role of fellowship, corporate worship, and the communal study of God's word. And so we're looking at creating small gatherings in each community that will be safe places for everybody to attend. We don't want to exclude anyone. We don't want to exclude the elderly. We don't want to exclude children. We certainly don't want to exclude the lost. And so we're working hard to come up with places and leaders and a plan for our services that allow us to fulfill those values of safety and participation by all. And, and I just, on a personal note, want to say thank you for continuing to be patient. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. I'm going to try to hit up as many of these uh, small barbecues or, or local gatherings as I possibly can to reconnect with you, to hear your thoughts, to clarify even some of the things I'm saying right now. Until then, let me leave you with these words out of 2 Corinthians. The grace and the, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Shoe Swap Community Church. Love you. Look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you this week.